Greetings, brothers and sisters from Miami, Florida. I'm Pastor Rich Wilkerson. It is my great joy to address you, my fellow laborers of the gospel, at the Christian Leaders Fellowship Online World Conference. Thank you for inviting me as your speaker for a session of Empowerment Talk. Also, I want to honor our dear brother, Pastor Ox Sue Park, for his many years of humble service for our Lord. His impact on so many tens of thousands of believers worldwide is noteworthy, and I honor him today. In this session, I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about my background. I believe it will lend credence to the direction I believe the Lord has for us today. My two grandfathers were mighty men of God. In 1886, my grandfather, James Arthur Garfield Wilkerson, was born. He was healed of tuberculosis in 1915 and became a great preacher. He was subsequently baptized in the Spirit soon after and then became a street preacher and finally a pastor. He had 10 children. One was my father. And one of his grandchildren was David Wilkerson, the founder of Teen Challenge drug rehabilitation centers, and the author of Cross the Switchblade, and the founder of Times Square Church in New York City. I, too, was one of his grandchildren. My other grandfather was D.P. Holloway. My mother's father was also a Pentecostal preacher and church leader. He had tent meetings all through the southeastern United States during Prohibition in the 1920s. One of his converts in Georgia was a young Jewish teenager named Edgar Bethany. The night Edgar came to the Lord and was saved, he came to my grandfather's tent side at about three in the morning and spoke to some of the guards. He told them that he'd been thrown out of his house by his Jewish father and had no place to go. My grandfather and grandmother took the young man in And he lived on the road with my grandparents for three years. He became a mighty man of God and a leader in the Assemblies of God organization as well. His youngest daughter was named Jan, if you can believe this. Later, she married Paul Crouch. And the two of them founded the Trinity Broadcasting Network in 1973, the year my wife and I were married. The reason I wanted to tell you that is because the people I represent are all in for Jesus. Nothing matters more to me than the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who know him not. Three of my four sons are preachers of this great gospel. And with God's help, we will not turn back. Hallelujah. Look with me, if you would, today to John chapter 3. Verses 5 through 8. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from, or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, of course, you know this to be the conversation that Jesus had with the Nicodemus the night that Nicodemus came after dark to ask Jesus questions. My topic today is born again people of the wind. Like I said earlier, my background is family and Pentecost. We're 100% all in. We believe in the Acts 2, 1 through 4 experience after salvation, but for me, it is also true for my family being Pentecostal or a born-again person of the wind is about much more than an experience. When I use the word Pentecost, I mean much more than that. I mean one who has been bathed inwardly and outwardly with the sweet presence of Jesus so that you are truly led of the Holy Spirit every minute of every day and that you are given over to the desires of the Holy Spirit. 
A true Pentecostal believer is one who seeks for God to control every nook and cranny of his or her life. A true 100% all-in, born-again person of the wind has little desire for themselves, except that it pleases their maker and that they occupy until Jesus returns. Growing up for me was all about God, healing, Holy Spirit, the rapture of the church. We had revival meetings six times a year in my father's church. These meetings always went two weeks at least. Missionaries from around the world would stay in our home at least every month. I heard stories of what God was doing around the world. I heard it all the time from my parents. Jesus is coming soon, son. Be ready. Stay away from sin. Run to Jesus. I can tell you I lived with conviction that I must serve my Savior and I must tell people about Jesus. Please listen to this. One of the greatest downfalls of the modern church is that we've gone from that convicts me to that offends me. I wasn't allowed to be offended growing up. I was only allowed to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and Jesus' ministers here on earth. My mom and dad had one desire, and that desire was to have God smile on their family. This was huge to my parents. They wanted to please God. Parents, let me ask you a question. When your children obey you, what do you do? If you're like me, you reach for your wallet, right? That's why we born again people of the wind were blessed a hundred years ago. God reached for his wallet. Because of that, growth occurred. Prosperity occurred. Divine health occurred. With the growth came a need for organization. We had to come together and organize ourselves for greater effectiveness, growth, organization, meetings, conferences, calls to worship, more meetings, more fine-tuning, and yes, more spiritual politics. I've seen the prayer meetings replaced with committee meetings. I've seen volunteerism replaced with paid help. I've seen Holy Spirit fervor replaced with a desire for man's favor. It's no longer knowing him so much, but who you know. It's no longer how can I take my city for God, but how can I fit in, in my community? It's spiritual politics. I, for one, don't want it. I want Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit. I want to be 100% all in. That's it. I'm afraid that like Achan of old, some of us have tried to keep the spoils of past victories when it was those very spoils God delivered our forefathers from. I'm speaking of a life of comfort and ease. If we're not careful, we've kept back something for ourselves just in case God doesn't deliver on his promises. And now we're trying to protect a memory of Pentecost. But friends, you can't bottle up a memory. You can't politicize the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus said the wind blows where he wants to blow. And we're either people of the wind or we're not. And I'm guilty of wanting a life of ease, and I don't want to be that guy. Instead, I want the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow through my life like never before. To be a born-again person of the wind, first of all, means to be fully led of the Spirit. Not crazy stuff, but when you feel His nudge, you go with it. Here's what King David said in Psalms 143 and verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. And here's what St. Paul said. Romans 8, 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, 
These are sons of God. You see, being led of the Spirit is to have your spirit as a result of your prayer life so attuned to His voice that you hear His voice, that you feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit. Do that. Go. Speak up. And you respond. Yes, it's a risk. But that's what faith is. Second, being a born-again person of the wind means that Holy Spirit conviction follows you as a man or woman of God. You don't just show up to be the nice guy or the beautiful woman at the table. No. You show up, and when you do, the Spirit of God shows up with you. In my early days on, on the road as a youth pastor, a youth evangelist, I spoke in public high schools, and it was very difficult to get in when I first started. I didn't have an entourage or a huge organization backing me. I didn't have people going in ahead of me to prepare the way. I did have local youth pastors who wanted a revival in their church. They wanted a move of God that would disrupt the usual way of doing things. On one occasion, while in the state of Oregon, I arrived there on a Saturday night by plane, and one of the local youth pastors picked me up at the airport, told me that they hadn't had any victories as to getting into the high schools that week. Every principal had said to him, you will never speak in my high school. I just simply said, the Lord will help us. In that moment, I heard the Spirit speak to me by a bullhorn. So we did that night. I preached the next morning to the congregation. And after it was over, the pastor met me and said, that was good, son. My wife and I are heading out for a couple days of R&R. You kids have fun while we're gone. Now, friends, let me say this. If there's going to be a move of God. It will usually begin among young people. 85% of all Christians on planet Earth accept Christ before they're 18 years of age. Yet here was a pastor saying, you kids have fun. Oh, we did. The next day, Monday, we headed to the biggest high school in the city with the bullhorn and went to the front of some of the hangouts that students frequented at lunchtime across the street from the school. I yelled into the bullhorn who I was and that I was writing a book and would be at the same place the next day to interview them if they had the courage to answer my questions. The next day, some 200 students were waiting in that same place. I started asking questions with the bullhorn and recording their answers. And when I finished, I didn't have a plan. All I had heard the Lord say was buy a bullhorn on Saturday night. As we were heading back to the van, one of the young men screamed, Hey, preach! What do you think about these questions you've asked us? I turned and said, I can't tell you right now, but if you get me in that high school across the street, I'll tell every one of them and you what I think. It has to be tomorrow, though. I leave on Thursday. Man, I'm telling you, instantly, they marched across the street. When I returned to my hotel, the message light was on in my hotel room. I, I listened to the message. It was the poor high school principal. He said, I desperately need to speak with you, Mr. Wilkerson. I called him and he said, I have 200 students doing a sit-in in front of my office. And they say they won't leave until I have you come tomorrow and speak. I did go the next day and spoke to 1,500 students in that big double-decker auditorium. Yes, there was a standing ovation, and yes, that night the church was packed, and the parking lots were jammed an hour before the service began. I was in the pastor's office before all of them showed up, laying on the floor, crying out to God for a move of his spirit, when the senior pastor walked in and said, what's going on? What are you doing? I said, oh, I'm sorry, pastor. I didn't know you were coming back from R&R. &R. Us kids have just been having fun while you've been gone. That night, over 300 students accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And over the next 18 years, I had the privilege of speaking in over 1,700 American and Canadian high school lyceum programs to nearly 1.5 million students, 
Hundreds of thousands gave their hearts to the Lord simply because I acted on a nudge of the Holy Spirit to buy a bullhorn. I found that everywhere I went, as long as I remained prayed up and humble before the Lord and man, Holy Spirit conviction followed me. We must get to that place as men and women of God till the convicting power of God surrounds our every move. Third, when you are a born-again person of the wind, the fear of God will surround your ministry. The scripture says of the early church apostles in Acts 2.43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, the King James Version says, and fear came upon every soul. You see, when Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead in the house of the Lord for lying and stealing before the Holy Spirit, the newspapers didn't cancel that church. No. The scripture says in Acts 5, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Now look at this in verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. You see, church, when the Spirit of God is in your life, I'm telling you, friends, people who come in contact with you are going to want to repent. They're going to want to realize that something much bigger is in play here than just a weekly church service. They'll have that feeling, I need to get right with God. I believe that when the fear of God hits our communities, our communities will be united in a love for God and a love for people like never before. Now, last of all, being a born again person of the wind means that your heart is so consumed with a love for people who need Jesus that it cannot rest until the job is completed. In my opinion, it will always be about people coming to salvation. Please let that sink in for a minute. It's not about small groups first. It's not about discipleship first. It's not about worship first. It's not about buildings and church business first. No. It's about the proclamation of the gospel to people that do not know the Lord. I must lead people to Jesus Christ, either one-on-one -on -one or in front of an audience. It makes no difference to me. Listen to the pathos in the words of our Lord when he entered Jerusalem for the beginning of Passion Week. It's found in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chick under her wings, and you were not willing. That was my own father's heart. Dad passed away in 2014. I told you all about my grandfather's on both sides, but I wanted to save this for last because my dad, John Wilkerson, was the greatest man of God I ever met in my life. He had moved with mom to Miami in 1998 with us to help me build our little inner city church, Trinity Church. We had a little over 250 Haitian people in our little beat up old building on the I-95 here in Miami. My wife used to say that the termites had locked elbows in order to hold the church pews together. <laughs> what a place that was. I was certain my dad saw our mission as his mission because my wife and I did not take a salary from the church for the first five years of our ministry here in Miami. But my father did not believe that you could have a mission in America. He believed that the American church was only here to send money overseas to where the real lost people were. Yet, no one, I repeat, no one 
was a better soul winner than my dad. We never went to a restaurant that he didn't say to the person serving us, have you met Jesus as your personal savior? He just never gave up, always bringing people to Christ. I travel out of Miami every other week preaching the gospel somewhere in the country to bring home money to keep this place going. But my father did two things. He led our new members class, which meant he spent half the day calling people from the church and encouraging them to go through his membership class. He was amazing. He took in 700 new members himself. The other thing he did was raise money for his friend, David Spencer, who was born and raised in Nicaragua by missionary parents. David was building a 3,000 seat auditorium in Managua and it was costing him $3 million. Now folks, this is over 10 years ago and I'm telling you, that was a lot of money for a church in downtown Managua. So my dad would stay on the phone half the day raising funds from friends of his across the country for the church in Managua. I'd get into arguments with dad. Dad, this is the mission right here. Dad, I don't take a salary. I need your help raising funds for Miami. His response, Rich, this isn't the mission field. This is America. <laughs> he was amazing. So I just let him do what he wanted to do. He's my dad. Yes. He raised about $250,000 for Brother Spencer and that $3 million church. And yes, he went down to the dedication with many of his pastor friends from here in America. That first dedication service in Managua, there were thousands of people, not just in the building jam, but around the building, inside and outside. But my dad found a homeless person in front of the church, dirty and on an alcoholic binge, my dad got some of his American friends to help him pick the man up and help him into the front row and sit with all the dignitaries from America. My dad's friends from America were saying, well, that's John Wilkerson, always thinking about the poor and disenfranchised. That morning when the minister finished preaching, dad led the drunken man to the altar during the altar call and led him to the Lord. Now, friends, you have to know this was a huge gala event in Managua. No one was prepared for a drunken homeless man to be a part of it. He smelled after all, but my dad insisted with his friend, David Spencer, David, that man has to come with the 50 American pastors to the nice luncheon after this dedication. David finally said, okay, John, bring him. Dad brought him. But then after it was over, dad said to David, we have to find a place for him to stay. David told my father, well, we can keep the drunken man in the church sleeping quarters that we've built for a night watchman, which they did. And the night watchman had not yet been hired. The next morning, dad went to see if the man was there and found out that the man could speak broken English. So they went and got him some clothes. And dad said, David, why don't you make him the night watchman? So David did. The man had a fairly good education, had fallen on hard times. Six months later, he was David's best helper at that church. One day, David had a problem that he needed government help and intervention with. He spoke to his new best helper, the former homeless man. The man said, Pastor David, we can just call my brother about that problem. Pastor Spencer said, who's your brother? The man said, well, my brother's the president of Nicaragua. David Spencer was shocked. At that time, the president was Bolaños. That afternoon, the two of them were in the president's office. The problem was fixed in a minute. and The president thanked the pastor for helping his beloved brother. That was my dad, John. Whatever it takes to reach people with the good news. Daddy died in 2014, and we had a huge homegoing service for him in Fresno, and all of my sons and their families were there. My youngest son was preparing for marriage and was almost graduated from Princeton Seminary at that time, and I had been given the opportunity to be given a building in Harlem, New York City, to start a church in. I was waiting to see 
if our church in Miami would be approved to take the church in Harlem over. It was an old nightclub in Harlem, paid off and valued at $10 million. I told my son Taylor that he uh, would need to move from Princeton to Harlem and help me start the church and then go back and forth to Princeton until he graduated. The next week, I got a call from the district superintendent in New York saying, Rich, it's approved. Trinity in Miami will lead this new congregation in Harlem. We had to wait until the man who was over church planning for our organization in the Northeast said yes. I think you know him. It's Jeff Leak. When he and his wife talked about it, Rich, you know his wife, Melody. But did you know, Rich, that Melody is David Spencer's daughter. I was shocked. When she heard that the Wilkerses in Miami were willing to lead the new church plant in New York City, she said, of course they will. After all his father did for my father, of course! Today there's a growing church in Harlem. Even during covid because a man of faith sat on a Haitian church in Miami and helped build a $3 million church building in Nicaragua that today runs 9,000 people on Sundays. Because he did, a thriving new church community in New York City is being led by that man's grandson, Taylor David Wilkerson. Pastor friend, I want to be a born again man of the wind. I don't want to do church. I want church to do me. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm confident that you feel the same way. And today as we bring this meeting to an end, please let me pray for you. Wherever you are watching this message from, please, please reach your hand towards mine as I pray. Lord Jesus, in this moment, my friend and I long to be spirit-filled people of the wind, born again people of the wind. I pray today that you would reach from where I am to where my friend is who's watching. I pray that you would infuse him infuse her with power from on high. That, Lord, we weep before we preach. That, Jesus, we will not give up until the mission you have touched us with is complete on our watch. Bless my friend, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I love you so much.